Hi gang, Rob here. It is the evening of 28 December 2015 and it's time for another installment in Rob and Steve's Traditional Knives Anthology in conjunction with How About the Truth? That'd be Steve. And guys, this one, you know, just pause the camera now, go to the bathroom, get whatever beverage you might need for the next, I don't know, 45 minutes or an hour and those of you who are traditional pocket knife connoisseurs are going to want to settle in and listen and look. Uh, I of course had to uh, get a cup of coffee in one of my Christmas presents. This is my uh, Griswold family Christmas fun old-fashioned Griswold family Christmas coffee cup. It's like a bucket. It holds like 20 ounces of coffee. I'm going to need it. Actually, I don't need the caffeine. I'm just going to need the whistle wetter. Because the subject matter of this video is going to give me all the stimulation I need. Mm. Forgive my sump pump. It is monsoon season in late December. Northeast Indiana and really most of the middle of the country. So what are you looking at guys? Well, let's let Steve tell us because he does such a good job. I'll just get right into his text and you guys will be able to tell when Steve stops and I start. I think we've been at this long enough that you can kind of tell the, how it goes. So off we go. Hey Rob and hello everyone. Thanks for stopping in. Today's installment is very special as we take another step way back in time to one of the greatest cutlery companies ever known, but largely forgotten or unknown to those of us who weren't around during the golden age of cutlery. Few, if any, companies could boast the number of innovations and sheer number of patterns produced as the Robeson Cutlery Company. And while I'm reading, I'm going to give you guys a look at these two beauties. Mm, 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 mm. At their peak production years, Robeson produced 1,200 different patterns, counting blade setups, handle options, and several of their innovations would change the way folding pocket knives were made, either directly or indirectly right up to today's modern tactical folders. Really, Robeson traditional pocket knife innovations influencing tactical folders. Huh, I think you're going to have to back that one up, Steve. Some of their innovations were truly unique and far ahead of their time, as you'll see a little later in this story. No matter what kind of folding knife you collect or EDC, we all owe a debt of gratitude to this historic giant. Robeson accomplished so much that it would be impossible to tell their story in short order. <laughs> so let us first have a look at two of their old knives and then delve into their history. So please stick around, guys, as the Robeson story is one of the most important in all of cutlery history. Now I've owned both of these knives for quite a while now and honestly I kept holding off on this video in the hopes that I could land just one more Robeson that's a more difficult pattern to produce and rarer than their simpler jack knives that do turn up on eBay fairly often. Unfortunately I've been unsuccessful so far. However the two knives we have here today are indeed a couple hard to find patterns for Robesons of this era. Both of these knives share the same tang stamping with uh, three lines. And let's see if we can grab this for you. Beginning with Robeson in block letters. The second line being Sure Edge in script. Followed by the third line once again in block letters saying Rochester. That might be a little hard to make out with the bolster. I might have to go to... There we go. Now you can see it. They never stamp years on their knives. 
but change the stampings throughout their history. Some stampings did overlap time periods, but each stamping was a definite indicator for a certain number of years. For example, the stamping on both these knives indicates years of manufacture beginning in 1922 and running through 1939, in which the stampings changed. That puts these knives anywhere from 76 to 93 years old, and they are regarded by many seasoned collectors to be among Robeson's better and most sought after stampings. Let's inspect the opposite end farmer's jack first. So let's get the stockman out of the way. Check out the outstanding and gorgeous jigging in these bone handles. Wow. They are the main reason I bid on this knife. Honestly, I have yet to see such intricate and complex jigging on any factory knife, including other Robesons. Only the finest custom-made knives sport such a fluid detail. And judging by the rather extensive wear on the main blade, and there is some, <clears throat> we can safely assume these handles have some pocket wear. I would have loved to see what they look like when new or near new, and I would have too. But man, they're still so gorgeous. The depth perception was probably even better than they are now. That main blade still has its full length and tip. Boy, it sure does. See how close the tip is to the opposing catch bit which is this piece of brass. There's a great shot of that. Uh, and this catch bit is brass, not steel, which would have been the norm. Actually, it is the first knife, uh, according to Steve, that he's ever seen with a brass catch bit. What an incredibly thin knife, and it sure is. Yet still has plenty of snap with that single spring. A traditional pocket cutlery 101 guys it is far more difficult to produce an opposite ended two blade jack with a single spring versus one with two springs check out how incredibly bl close those blades have to fit in that narrow blade well look at that and these blades have lateral grinds they are not kinked. So what Steve means by that is these blades are ground to be uh, not straight. So if there's a good shot. <clears throat> Look at the main blade, how it starts off in the center of the frame and then goes all the way to the left side. So that wasn't done with a, uh, an arbor press and a soft tang, kinking that blade to make it go that direction. According to Steve, let's see if he's telling us the truth. The pattern number 662680 is on the pile side of the main blade. And there it is. With the blades closed and the point of the main blade pointing towards the camera, you can see how incredibly closely those blades fit. It is the thinnest 4-inch two-bladed knife I've ever seen, says Steve. You can also see how the main blade grind takes that lateral dive to allow for that secondary blade. The back spring also tapers, being taller at one end than the other. So let's see if we can catch that. So on this end is where the back spring interfaces with the tang of the main blade. So note that thickness in your mind. And then we'll come back here. And look at how much thinner it is where it interfaces with the tang of the secondary blade. <clears throat> this knife is so precisely built you can open either blade with no blade rub. Amazing, says Steve. He 
He's right. You see any rub on that main blade? Or on the spay? Nope. <clears throat> the shield has two pins. And he says, Rob, you can go ahead and show our viewer friends how well the blades snap shut. Let her rip! And, you know, guys, on some of Steve's really old, you know, century-old traditionals that he has sent for the anthology, he has made special note to just let the blades close from almost their closed position like that. <clears throat> Uh, that's a good practice on old knives with brittle, possibly highly stressed bone covers. But this thing does have some seriously nice walk and talk. It is a sweet sound for such an old knife, says Steve. I couldn't find any information about Robeson's jigging techniques. But I've yet to see any other knife with this outstanding bone work. Let's just take another macro look at that, shall we? It's just so random. I mean, it's almost like something God did in nature. It makes me wonder, says Steve, if it was done by hand versus machine. This knife has one sunken joint, so what does that mean? Okay, I'm going to open the main blade. Let's look at where the tang of the secondary meets the frame. Notice it's flush. That's a sunken joint. The other is close to being sunken. and See the main blade almost. <clears throat> I believe this is the older knife of the two because it isn't a pocket ease model, but perhaps it was a pattern that helped to inspire the pocket ease line of knives not much later. Which brings us to the other knife, pattern 632-595. Let's see if that's on the tang. It is. This is a three-blade stockman and is a member of the Pocket Ease line of Robeson. So let's check it out, shall we? Look at that. Sunken joints, two of them on that end, and one on this end. Isn't that a beauty? Time to turn the page, my friend. Now, all of the Pocket Ease line sports a double pinned shield with this name. Notice the gorgeously embossed Pocket Ease shield, pin on each end. <clears throat> they were all made with sunken joints, so the blade backs won't wear holes in the pants pockets. You'll notice both of these knives share the same 4 inch serpentine frame and bolsters, although the farmer's jack is a lined bolster and butt cap and the pocket ease stockman no lines both knives are the most streamlined serpentine pattern at four inches that I've ever seen I was told that this very stockman variant is especially rare among other robust and stockmans and that it has no sheep's foot but a second smaller clip point blade in its place. And there is the small clip. I was also told that this very pattern is pictured along with a short description of its rarity in the Book of Antique and Collectible Knives and Their Values, written by Bruce Voiles. It has a beautiful pair of antique green bone handles which are among the most sought after. And it's going to be hard to pick up. Maybe not, though, against this piece of leather. I think you can see the green hue. When you look at this knife uh, <clears throat> by itself, it looks like, you know, sort of a, an autumn jigged bone or an amber antique yellow. But there you can really pick up the green, I think. 
Uh, someone obviously rescued this knife not a moment too soon as it was abused, and that abuse came in the form of neglect. I believe the original owner used the knife until the factory edges would no longer cut and simply tossed it in a drawer and forgot about it where the blades began to rust and pit. What a shame. It would have been in near mint condition otherwise. I can see no evidence this knife has ever been sharpened. <clears throat> Actually upon close inspection the factory edge, edge can still be seen at the base of both secondary blades. Let's pull them out and look. Well, you sure can. He says, I have butter knives that are sharper than these blades, lol. Uh, this knife with the blade pitting is in very good condition and still holds a respectable value. I want to consult with someone uh, if I can go ahead and sharpen it without affecting its value, but until then I'm going to have to listen to my buddy Rob pick on me, lol. Uh, you got that right. I mean, they're already pitted. We might as well make them sharp. I mean, for goodness sake. I don't know. You guys know me. I'm more of a user than a collector. <sighs> okay, now note the fancy jeweled liners. Let's see if we can note the fancy jeweled liners. Oh, this might be hard to see, guys. Uh, the jeweling goes around the perimeter of both outer brass liners. Can you see it? There I think we can pick up a little bit of it. <clears throat> there is a little bit of pocket wear which makes this jeweling a little hard to see. But you'll notice the fantastic walk and talk on all three blades. Oh. Dude, guys, this knife is, uh, you know, let's say <clears throat> 80 years old. This has got, like, no kidding, this has got the walk and talk of, you know, kind of a legendary larger frame knife. You know, the Queen Big Congress. Oh, just awesome. Uh, once many folks tried one of these pocket ease knives for the per first time, they loved their smooth, sleek surfaces so much they refused to ever buy any other knife brand. As I briefly mentioned earlier, most of the original old Robeson knives found on eBay are usually simpler sleeve board or teardrop jacks or something similar. I have still yet to see either of these two knives before the camera in any condition on eBay. Very rare indeed. He's back paging me, guys. This is one of the finer made serpentine stockmans in that it is engineered using only three liners. Oh, here we go, guys. I should do an edit. You see the jeweling now? From straight on, it's most, most visible. So many stockmans use a fourth liner that is gutted out just like a center liner but it's installed right against the rear liner. Acting as a spacer to allow more room in the blade well. Instead of that fourth liner, Robeson ground all the blades and springs slightly thinner overall to produce a thinner knife. And once again, just like that two-bladed farmer's jack, we can see how nicely everything nestles. Uh, GEC has also done this with some of their stockmans. Now for the Robeson story. I hope you all will find it as interesting as many of us do. And for good reason, you'll hear now for the very first time on any YouTube channel. 
Okay, guys. Before we get into the Robin his, uh, Robeson history, it might be a good time for you to hit pause. You know, go take care of a little business. Maybe uh, fill up the coffee cup. Mm. And come on back for a nice company tale. Okay, y'all done? All right. The History of Robeson Cutlery. Millard F. Robeson was born on April 8, 1847 in Farmersville. All right, this guys, you, you ever have one of those words that you know what it's supposed to sound like and every time you try to make it sound like that, you just can't, but I'm going to go for it. In Farmersville, Cattaraugus County, New York. Around 1875, M.F. Robeson was a successful traveling salesman for the Rochester Stamping Works Company of Rochester, New York. During this time, he was selling imported knives from England and Germany as a sideline business. Old MF, isn't that funny, MF, began his side business of selling these imported knives out of his top dresser drawer in his bedroom. As business grew rapidly, his inventory grew to the point the knives took over the entire dresser, eventually spreading to his closet, I know how that feels, and even under their bed. He returned home from a business trip to find his wife had stacked all his knives out on the front porch. He built an additional room onto their house and eventually an entirely new detached building. Mr. Robeson became a major stockholder with the Rochester Stamping Works Company about that same time. This company manufactured all forms of household products from gas cans to tea kettles and silent butlers to portable electric fans. Anything that could be stamped out of sheet metal and assembled, they made it. Strict tariffs against imported knives in 1890 and 1897 forced Robeson to begin his own manufacturing. More on these tariffs a little later. Mr. Robeson settled on a small firm in Camelus, New York, owned by two master cutlers who had come from England. The two men were also brothers-in-law named Charles E. Sherwood and Denton E. Bingham. Robeson started this knives made under contract business bearing his name in about 1895. He had the Rochester Stamping Works stamp out the blade blanks and put his very first tang stamp on those blades which he shipped to Sherwood and Bingham who actually produced the knives with a small crew of knife makers with mostly ebony handles. <clears throat> in spring of 1898 the Wyckoff Harvester Company, makers of large grain and crop harvester machines, with ties to Indiana, by the way, uh, used on large farms, had moved out of their old factory in Perry, New York, and a local businessman uh, enticed Millard Robeson to move his cutlery company into the vacated factory in Perry. We do not know if any of the crew from the small Camelus firm moved with Robeson to Perry, New York, but it should be noted that not very long after the small firm left behind did eventually become Camelus Cutlery with no ties to Robeson. It was also along this time that word spread over the entire country about Robeson's demanding production methods of the highest quality. Sound familiar, Bill Howard? Robeson's business soon outgrew the Perry plant wherein they built a 90 by 40 three-story brick building complete with a two-story underground basement that ran the full length of the structure right next to the original buildings of his Perry plant. This new plant was self-sufficient, producing all of its own power from three different sources of gas, steam, and water. With the combined energy being created to run what was a huge primitive generator known as a dynamo. <clears throat> This system generated a total of 250 horsepower, which was actually producing enough power to run 600 lights, in addition to all the machinery with plenty of power in reserve. And so began the peak years of quality and production numbers for the entire history of Robus and Cutlery, where 400 skilled workers combined with this power source to produce more than 1.5 million knives per year. 
For only 400 workers, this was an incredible feat, even by today's standards. As a side note, Remington's plant employed double or more workers, I believe, and produced 3.5 million knives per year. Folks, those sheer numbers of such high quality is why we call it the golden age of cutlery. Can you imagine um, 1.5 million knives per year from Robeson and 3.5 million knives from Remington? What is that, 5 million knives a year? Can you, can you imagine 5 million traditional pocket knives being sold in one year right now? <clears throat> I don't think so. Okay, let's continue. Millard Robeson died December 30th, 1903. He was only 56 years old. <clears throat> Although his sons were raised in the business, all their efforts were ham hampered with two world wars and the Great Depression to varying degrees as Robeson Cutlery forged ahead, still making huge numbers of high quality knives, but financial instability was brewing beneath the surface as with many other companies. <clears throat> the company had 52 traveling salesmen to cover the entire country, as well as international sales. The whole time, M.F. Robeson plus his two sons were also operating for the Rochester Stamping Works. It should also be noted that Robeson added a large distribution building in Rochester with direct access to the railroad. The knives made at the Perry plant were all shipped to their distribution center in Rochester. This is what causes confusion for many people as most or all of the tank stamps say Rochester. No knives were ever made in Rochester. Wait, see correction on back of this page. Steve told me this was hard to write. Correction, for a very brief period, some of the military knives were indeed produced in Rochester during the Big War WW2. Although no literature gives any details, I suspect these Rochester made knives were limited to only fixed blade types as they're far easier to produce versus a multi-bladed pocket knife. They erected a small factory for these knives, which the Rochester Stamping Works stamped out of sheet stamped blades out of sheets of steel this mini factory was only used for three or four years okay now the pocket ease program that's this one here boys <clears throat> was started sometime after 1910 the history is vague on this topic However, in 1910, they started a new separate brand and tank stamps that were called Terrier and Terrier Cutlery. These are 100% Robeson made and some of the most prized and sought after. Look for these knives, guys. You are going to love hearing the story from here on with innovation and a very famous name comes into the picture. <clears throat> some years after the Pocket Ease program had been underway, Robeson began an innovation never seen or used before that's still used to this very day, albeit in a modified fashion. Actually, several modified fashions that are in the latest tactical folders you own right now. The name of this program was called the Mastercraft series of folding knives. On the cam end of each blade tank, they installed a so imagine this, guys. On the cam end, that's the rounded end of the blade tank, they installed a pressed-in U-shaped bronze bearing. The idea, of course, was to pro provide a smoother action with less wear and tear on both the tang and the backspring surfaces. All of these knives were graced with a Mastercraft shield. See diagram below. So here we are. So here's the blade. <clears throat> There's your proper sharpening notch, the kick, and the blade tang. <clears throat> and then in the shaded area would be that bearing. And notice the teeth. So <clears throat> it would have been pressed on 
in that direction with the teeth interlocking <clears throat> and holding it on. So he says the previous diagram is not exact, but pretty close. I think I added too many of the teeth, but you get the idea. <clears throat> the Mastercraft knives are very rare today and highly sought after as well. Beware of the more recent knives with the Robeson stamps and Mastercraft shields, as the Ontario Knife Company owns all the trademarks today, and Queen innocently produces these replicas, but without the bronze bearings. If you see one, or, one of 100, or one of 200, or one of 300, etc. etched on the blade, they're only replicas. <clears throat> Queen cutlery and a date may also be stamped on the pile side of the tanks. These are not counterfeits. They are properly licensed, but not the originals. The genuine Mastercrafts were made by the tens of thousands, so there's no limited number etches. Now, these bearings did fall out of some of the knives. And going back to the diagram, I think Steve's got these uh, the tooth design kind of right, and I, you know, it's not like a a, a dovetail joint. So as things wore, and those bearings got jostled by interaction with the back spring, occasionally the teeth would loosen and out would pop the bearing. <clears throat> Now, Robeson did offer the best warranty ever, even with this in mind. You didn't even need a reason. Just mail in the knife, even battered and abused, and Robeson replaced it with a new knife. No questions asked. Even though hordes of dishonest people took advantage and abused this policy, Robeson still replaced the knives. Now, the following chapter of the Robeson story is everybody's favorite who have heard it. So grab another bowl of popcorn, guys. Before World War II started, the once protective tariffs on imported knives had been lifted. And cheap German imported knives, just think about that, guys. Cheap German imported knives were just crushing American sales. Uh, in the past, tariffs had protected USA knife, sale, knife sales by penalizing imports with a high sales tax. Now, like other companies, Robeson was in big trouble because of this, and it was put up for sale. A smart, savvy businessman named Saul Frankel bought the company. Although Mr. Frankel was a wise individual, he knew absolutely nothing about the cutlery business. But as fate would have it, <clears throat> something else was brewing in one of the other cutlery companies owned by a part of the famous Case family. The Kinfolks Cutlery Company was owned by Gene Case, who had his cousin Emerson Case running the platform. The unions had been enticing the Case workforce to unionize, and Gene Case warned his people if they unionized, he would shut the plant down. They thought he was bluffing. Upon unionizing the following morning, they all showed up for work, only to find the entire plant chained and padlocked <clears throat> with a large sign hanging on the front door that said, Plant Closed indefinitely gone horse racing. <laughs> Due to varying versions of the Robeson story of clarifications in order, Emerson Case was hired to run the Robeson plant in Perry, New York about 1940. But it wouldn't be until 1957, November of that year to be exact, when Gene Case closed his kinfolks cutlery plant permanently due to the unions trying to take over his operation. And the story is true about closing overnight and the sign over the front door. <clears throat> As already mentioned, bronze bearings were falling out of many of the Mastercraft series of knives, but Emerson Case came up with an ingenious alternative upon his arrival at Robeson, where he moved the location of the bronze bearing onto the inner backspring surface. So let's get an idea of what we're talking about. Okay, it's so dark. There you go, right here, instead of the bearing being pressed into that cammed tang, 
it was laid into that, that interfacing surface of the back spring, probably brazed in, I would guess. <clears throat> this worked great. It achieved the same result. Much simpler to produce. Probably more reliable. And the bronze bearing remained in place because the blade tang always keeps pressure against the bearing surface. Most of the older design Mastercraft knives also had a blade etch that said NEV-R-BIND, never bind, oilless bearings. But that new improved <clears throat> design received a new name called Perma Lube, P E R M A L U B E. And these knives had a blue a, bl a new blade etch that said Perma Lube slash oil less bearings. All of the Perm Lube series knives can be identified with unmarked bronze shields of differing sizes and shapes. Now, Emerson Case worked long, hard hours at Robeson and also traveled extensively on behalf of the company. Even though the company had been in financial trouble as World War II unfolded, the demand for knives of all kinds for the troops lifted Robeson back into the black. All of their military contract knives from both world wars, ranging from the TL-29 type electrician's knives for the Army Signal Corps to the M3 Commando trench knives to machetes and everything in between, the Robeson brand enjoyed the highest consistent rank rankings among all the manufacturers. The other companies did make great knives for the military and they too deserve their place in history but Robeson's were considered to be the best, and this also included their shark knives for the Navy and their scout utility knives. After World War II, Emerson Case was made company president and continued to be innovative. In 1950, he developed a heat treating process for stainless blades that is still unsurpassed and still used to this very day worldwide. He named the process of cryogenic quenching as the quote frozen heat treat brand that's an interesting name it was used on both kitchen and pocket cutlery for Robeson to this day brand new kitchen knife sets of Robeson's with the frozen heat brand are 50 plus years old yet still as good as any other and better than most for performance they can still be found on eBay for rock bottom prices buy them if you can find them and put them to good use. So, for those of you who don't know, this is Rob now. Cryogenic quenching is, is a process that sort of continues the quench. So you take a knife that's, you know, in solution over its austenizing temperature, 1700 degrees or so. You dump it into oil that's 180 degrees, quickly cooling it bringing out the structure to its hardest uh, maximum hardness <clears throat> then what sometimes happens in that process is that you get something called retained austenite which are uh, little globs of material still in solution they got trapped and couldn't quench out into martensite the hard stuff the needles that make a knife hard so you put it in a deep freeze at about a negative 270 degrees and it finishes the quenching process it can sit in there for two or three hours that retained austenite slowly comes out of solution and becomes martensite it's a way of sort of getting absolutely the most structure and hardness out of the steel that's possible <clears throat> but I digress back to Steve about 1955, Emerson Case also developed a line of knives with tungsten carbide applied to only one side of the blade edge. This was a complicated process and not readily understood by many people. The problem was the blades were designed only to be sharpened on the side without the tungsten carbide layer, which leaves a fine microscopic serrated edge of tungsten to cut with. <clears throat> Too many people would buy a new knife, remove it from the box that contained important information, throw the box away, and had no idea they were about to ruin the intended purpose by honing both sides. This included many pocket knives, hunting, and kitchen knives. These had the Flame Edge branding. I have yet to hear from anyone <clears throat> who has experience with this line of Robesons who knew you had to sharpen only the normal side of the blade. 
If you do, please let us all know. So after Gene Case closed his plant in 1957, the Kinfolks brand was bought by Robeson, and they made several lines of pocket and hunting knives with the Kinfolks tang stamps. Several handle materials were used, but most had the now famous strawberry bone handles by Robeson. That really hasn't been duplicated to this day. Actually, this gorgeous color of bone was started in 1948, and around 1959 they switched to Delrin. Unfortunately, the Delrin handles come nowhere close to the dyeing process used for the bone handled versions for sheer beauty. Now, moving ahead to 1964, once again, hard times befell Robeson. Sales were down, knives were made but not shipped. The owners decided to sell the company to Cutler Federal Corporation with the stipulation that Emerson Case remained for a period of time of one year after which he retired. In 1965, the famous Perry plant was closed forever. The new owners would now produce the Robeson brand under contract only to none other than the Camelus Cutlery Company. How ironic. As fate would have it, Robeson got started and ended with Camelus. Some say Camillus. If you're watching this and you're from Camillus, Camillus, let me know in a comment what's the proper way to say that. I know it's not Catagoras. In 1977, Cutler Federal sold Robeson, the brand, to the Ontario Knife Company, who still has the Robeson brand produced in name only by their sister company, no longer their sister company, by the way, Queen Cutlery, and only occasionally. Although Camillus and Queen have produced some really nice knives with the Robeson brand, most collectors only recognize the knives that were made at the Perry factory in New York as the true Robesons. In summary, perhaps no other cutlery company could boast the innovations and patents that Robeson engineered in so many of their edged products. Far too many to list here. Believe it or not, this is the short version <laughs> of the history of Robeson. They invented punches, can openers, combo gadgets to fit into a folding knife that usually perform better than the competition. They had over 1,200 patterns and used many handle materials including stag, pearl, and composition handles. They also had some of the most beautiful colors and jigging on their bone handles. From 1900 to 1950, worldwide polls asked folks to name their favorite knife. And although many were rightfully mentioned, two companies always received the most votes. They were the New York Knife Company and Robeson. Until next time. And that, my friends, is it for this one. I hope you enjoyed watching and listening as much as Steve and I did putting it together. What a couple beauties. I think I'm just going to hang on to this one and sharpen it. <laughs> That's all for this one, my friends. Stick around for the next installment of the Traditional Knives Anthology. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember the word, if not Steve's Robeson pocket knives, is sharp. <laughs>